Hello and welcome again to our time of devotions. We are now in the 21st chapter of Acts. Spent quite a bit of time on chapter 20 because of Paul's um, farewell address to the elders that are um, that were overseeing the Ephesian church. But now we are in chapter 21. He is now um, departing from them. So let's pray and we'll get into it today. Father, thank you for your word. You, uh, you're perfect in every way. And as we go into your word, we thank you for all of who you are, your kindness, your mercy, and your love, your perseverance, and your spirit. Now, as we go into your word, please open up our minds again to hear your voice in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 21, verse 1. After we tore ourselves away from them, we set sail straight for Kos. The next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. Finding a ship crossing over in Phoenicia, we boarded and set sail. After we sighted Cyprus, passing to the south of it, we sailed on to Syria and arrived Tyre, since the ship was to unload its cargo there. Now, Tyre is uh, a city that's on the on the coast of Israel. So now they've 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 managed to get back to the mainland, if you will. We sought out the disciples. This is verse four, and stayed there seven days. Through the Spirit, they told Paul not to go to Jerusalem. When our time had come to an end, we left to continue our journey while all of them, with their wives and children, accompanied us out of the city. After kneeling down on the beach to pray, we said farewell to one another and boarded the ship, and they returned home. When we completed our voyage from Tyre, we reached Ptolemus where we greeted the brothers and sisters that stayed with them for a day. The next day we left and came to Caesarea, where we entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. This man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. Now there's a few different Caesarea. This is Caesarea Maritime, which is on the coast. There's Caesarea Philippi, which is where... um, uh, Peter had the revelation that Jesus was the Messiah. So they arrived there, and in verse 10, after we had been there for several days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. He came to us, took Paul's belt, tied his own feet and hands, and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews in Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, both we and the local people pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. We, meaning Luke, who is the author of of Acts, and those other people that are with him. Then Paul replied, what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Since he would not be persuaded, we said no more except the Lord's will be done. And this is a very powerful, um, powerful exchange. You know, in, 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 there, there's a, there is a very powerful bond that believers have. And that bond, when, when it's nurtured and, and the spirit has developed it and there's a true fellowship, it is such that we really do feel each other's pains and sufferings and we rejoice in each other's victories. It's that tight. And to think that one of your, not just close friends, but a very powerful voice for the gospel will be treated this way and the fear that that can invoke 
to, to experience that is, is, is very deep. It's a deep, it's a deep connection and a deep experience and a deep relationship. And yet Paul, because of the faith that he has, is able to not be overcome by this fear, is not overcome by the threat. Remember the Agabus who came down said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. There's no reason to doubt that Agabus was prophesying truthfully and in the spirit. And yet, there's a, a surrendering, a complete surrendering to the, prop, to the sovereignty and the providency, if you will, of God's will, of trusting yourself wholly and completely to what he's called you to do and to his care, to his protection, to his faithfulness. So they continue on with verse 15. After this, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea, Caesarea, or Caesarea also went with us and brought us to Manasseh of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to stay. When we reached Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters welcomed us warmly. The following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard it, they glorified God and said, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are who have believed, and they are zealous for the law. But they have been informed about you that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to abandon Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or to live according to our customs. So what is to be done? They will certainly hear that you've come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have made a vow. Take these men purify yourself along with them and pay for them to get their heads shaved. Then everyone will know that what they were told about you amounts to nothing, but that you yourself are also careful about observing the law. Now, what is happening here? This is a very interesting, very, very interesting uh, conflict that, that is setting itself up. As they said in verse 20, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are who have believed. So in Jerusalem, there are thousands of Jews who believe in the name of the Lord Jesus, that he himself is the anointed one that was promised in the prophets. He himself is the one that the prophets refer to that will redeem Israel. He is the son of God. He was indeed killed the day before Passover and rose from the dead on the first day of the week in accordance with the scriptures. And that in his name, the Holy Spirit comes to us. These are Jews that believe that. But also, as we see, they are zealous for the law. That word zealous is intentional. It means they are willing, because of their zeal, to act out in violence. This goes all the way back to the Old Testament, where there was um, a spear that was picked up in and plunged through an Israelite, and I believe it, a Mo, not a Moabite, um, was it, uh, I can't remember, but one of the, the women of the enemy camp that had enticed them into worshiping their gods of fertility. And when the, when the pole was, or the spear was driven through them, it was because of the zealousness of the, of the one who, who did that act. And Paul himself in his letter says, I too was zealous for the law to the extent that I too 
was willing to and did approve of acts of violence. So zealousness here means the same thing, that there are Jews who truly believe in everything that the Lord Jesus represents and they're zealous for the law. Now, this is a very conflicting area of spirituality because as Paul is ministering in the power of the Holy Spirit and as one who was a stringent adherent to the law, he's saying the law does not make one righteous. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't observe the law, but when you observe the law as a means of righteousness, it will work against you because it will take away from the righteousness that was secured for you through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's nothing that needed, needs to be added to his perfect sacrifice. The perfect exchange that took place at the cross. He took up our sin. We receive his righteousness. He took up the punishment for sin. We receive the forgiveness. He took upon him death. We receive his life. And so the cross in and of itself is complete in its work to procure righteousness for us, which means to make everything right. It's right. It's just the right way of God. So when Jews practice the law while believing in Jesus, what's necessary because Paul also observed the law, but Paul did not observe the law as a means of righteousness. He observed the law for the beauty of what it was, which signified the Jews as God's anointed chosen people, but he never observed the law as a means or ways of righteousness. And so when he ministered to the Gentiles, he did not force them to enter into the observance of the law. What he did is he baptized, some, sometimes he baptized, sometimes he didn't, but he promoted and preached baptism, which was the commitment of people to follow Jesus and discipleship and to the gathering of the saints. Now, there are certain things that he instructed them to do, which is to abstain from sexual immorality and uh, food offered to, 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 to idols because it was so convoluted with the occult. But, but the observance of the law was something that the Gentiles no longer had to do because the Lord had chosen them and signified that he chose them by the fact that they believed. And so this was the, the conflict that was set up when Paul finally made his way back to Jerusalem, which is the epicenter of observing the law. They still had the temple in play. So they were still having the sacrificial system. And so this is the conflict that, that Paul finds himself uh, walking into. And in verse uh, 22, so what is to be done? They will certainly hear what, that you've come and therefore do what we tell you. And what they tell him is to get involved in this Jewish observance of purification. And when those that are observing you see that you're involved in observing the law, these rumors will go away. Verse 25, with regard to, to the Gentiles who have believed, we have written a letter containing our decision that they should keep themselves from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from what is strangled, and from sexual immorality. So this is the overall understanding that Gentiles are the equivalent of their brothers, their Jewish brothers, through faith as regards to being sons and daughters of the kingdom but as Gentiles, they are no longer required to observe the law because their righteousness comes by faith and faith alone. And this is a, a very big um, theater of conflict because man's internal desire is to try to create a way in which he is in control of righteousness as compared to surrendering to the faith of God. And the power that we have as Christians comes not in our observance, but in our submitting to the faith 
and to the holding on of that faith and living by that faith that makes us righteous. Thank you so much for tuning in. Next time we're going to get in to see what happens. There's a riot that takes place at the temple and uh, we'll get into that next time. But in the meantime, may the peace of God be with you. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.